for us to make a start on this afternoon's event. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Faye Lopez Colimo, and I'm one of the directors of the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute. It's my privilege to be serving in the role of chairman for this afternoon's event. It is truly a great pleasure to be here with you this afternoon, chairman and directors of the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute, Professor Mervyn King, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. It is really wonderful to be welcoming you this afternoon to the opening ceremony of Governance Week. This being the second version of the Institute's signature event, which we inaugurated in 2020. This year's event bears the fitting title, Governance Beyond COVID, Following the North Star, Resetting Values to Create Value in Organizations. For the past 18 months, we've all been part of a global crisis which has been more or less severe in various parts of the world, manifesting in waves that ebbed and flowed as variants of less and greater concern have evolved, making us all wonder when there may be an end to the strange environment we are inhabiting and when will some semblance of normalcy return. Truly, it has been a time of great turbulence that we would all like to put behind us. Troubling as they are, however, times of turbulence are also opportunities for change, evolution, growth, and development. Never before has the world been so small. Never before have we seen such severe distress flow across our planet, leaving virtually no country untouched. We are faced with new choices and new demands. What more opportune a time then to reflect on the values that have sustained us to this point and consider how they may be reset to create value in a future that has become more and more uncertain. It is our hope this afternoon's event will provide a fitting start for such reflection. As indicated in the agenda, our CEO, Mrs. Kamala Rambasada Silva, will offer her welcoming remarks after that, we will receive greetings from our gold sponsor, followed by greetings from the chairman of the Institute, Mr. Nigel Romano. Our keynote address will follow these remarks and will be presented by Professor Mervyn King. And then we hope we will engage with what will be a very stimulating panel discussion, followed by an opportunity for your contributions to be made and your questions to be answered. I'm sure we're all looking forward to an engaging discussion with our very distinguished speakers. And I won't linger too long in this opening so that I may allow the kickoff to commence. I will now formally introduce Mrs. Kamala Rampasada Silva, the Chief Executive Officer of the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute to present welcome remarks on behalf of the Institute. Kamla is well known to most of you. She brings a wealth of experience and a passion for corporate governance to the Institute. She has been lecturing in this field at the MBA level in Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana for several years. She's a past and current board member of the Project Management Institute Southern Caribbean chapter and is currently a member of the board of directors of CTS College here in Trinidad. Kamla, I welcome you to make your remarks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Faye. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to today's opening ceremony for Governance Week 2021, entitled Governance Beyond COVID, following the North Star, resetting values to create value in organizations. As Faye mentioned, I am Kamala Rampasad de Silva, and I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute. In welcoming all of you, I want to share that the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute is a nonprofit membership organization. And we welcome everyone who wishes to join in our purpose of improving corporate governance practices in the region. For our inaugural Governance Week last year, we were extremely fortunate to have Professor Bob Garrett delivering our opening keynote. Professor Garrett has since become a friend and advisor to the Institute and was instrumental in us being able to organize Professor Mervyn King as our keynote speaker today. Thank you very much, Professor Garrett. We are very happy to welcome Professor Mervyn King, who is one of the world's foremost authorities on corporate governance today. 
We are so happy, Professor King, that you have chosen to share your wisdom with us today. Professor King's contribution to the development of governance thought has been instrumental in many of the practices around the world. However, as both he and Professor Garrett have made play, we are far from where we want to be in terms of effectiveness in many boardrooms today. Therefore, we at CCGI are happy to be able to invite you and the many other participants in the room today to be a part of the conversation as we seek to improve corporate governance practices. Some brief housekeeping announcements I'd like to make before um, we move on to our next speaker. And that is we are in a Zoom meeting room and we are not in a webinar. This means everyone is in the same virtual space, able to see and communicate with each other, which allows us to feel more connected. It's important, therefore, that we know who is in the room with us. So we ask persons to ensure that they identify themselves properly in the room. To do this, make sure that you rename yourself if you have joined in as a Galaxy or iPhone. And if you are not sure how to do so, you can message any of us who are hosts or co-hosts on this um, Zoom and we would be able to assist you in that regard. I say this only because if there are persons who we don't recognize, we will have to move you out of the room. Also, we would like to ask everyone to keep their microphones on, on mute during the presentation and panel discussion. For those of you who may be new to Zoom, there's an icon at the bottom of your screen to raise your hands when you want to get our attention for the Q&A segment. You will need to unmute yourself and then press the mute icon again as soon as you are done to minimize any disruptive noises. You may also make comments or ask questions in the chat feature during the session, as we have technical support in the background to help ensure that your message is relayed. Those of you who need to earn CPDs or PDUs as part of your ongoing certification, you may use these sessions to claim your points. In order to do so, however, you need to have been registered for the session and you need to send us an email requesting the same. We would verify your attendance at the session before issuing a certificate with the CPD or PDU hours. As I bring my close, uh, my welcome remarks to a close, I would like to extend sincere appreciation to our sponsors, Republic Bank Limited, our gold sponsor, and our two bronze sponsors, PwC and Angostura Limited. This is the second year that Republic Bank has generously offered their support with sponsorship, and we thank them sincerely. We look forward to building long-term relationships with them and our other corporate bodies like PwC and Angostura, which are interested in helping us to engage the conversation and training to help build effectiveness in the boardroom. Over the next five days, more than 50 professionals from around our region will be offering insights and advice on how we may improve our governance practices. I want to extend my sincere appreciation to all of them as well. Our speakers, panelists, and moderators will be given off their time over the next few days. Thank you for believing in us at CCGI and for agreeing to contribute to our collective development. I look forward to all the many stimulated conversations which would follow. Thank you. Thank you, Kamala. Just making sure my, my mic was unmuted. It's now my pleasure to introduce Mrs. Kimberly Araya Ali, Group General Counsel and Corporate Secretary of Republic Bank Limited, to deliver greetings on behalf of our whole sponsor, Republic Bank. Kimberly. Thank you, Faye. Professor Mervyn King, Chair Emeritus, King Committee South Africa, Mr. Nigel Romano, Chairman of the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute, the CCGI, Ms. Kamala Rampasad de Silva, CEO, CCGI, Ms. Faye Lopez Collimore, Director, CCGI, Professor Frank Kuneman, Attorney at Law, Mr. R Richard Rambaran, Executive Director, Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Ms. Camille Facey, Attorney at Law, attendees. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second annual Governance Week hosted by the CCGI. 
I am pleased this afternoon to deliver opening remarks on behalf of the gold sponsor, Republic Bank Limited. Amidst the uncertainty which has permeated our existence over the last two years, entities with sound governance have no doubt emerged and perhaps even stronger by being able to demonstrate the transparency and stability in their processes and policies, as well as having robust con control frameworks capable of quickly identifying and mitigating risks. The pandemic has shown that among businesses and institutions, regardless of size, industry, or sector, strong co corporate governance is a key ingredient to achieving resilience. Many entities would have been motivated by the disruption of the pandemic to pivot their business models to include better governance, especially within low touch business practices and economies. Many non-face-to-face -face businesses rely on trust and this is in itself is underpinned by good governance. The recognition that these changes were required now to ensure the future of tomorrow would no doubt have contributed to the survivability of many of these businesses. This approach continues to earn stakeholder trust, create value and enable continuity. At Republic Bank Limited and within the Republic Financial Group, there is not only a culture of maintaining good governance in accordance with current laws and practices, but more than that, there is a strategic imperative to constantly be outward looking and to seek out opportunities to enhance our governance for the benefit of both internal and external stakeholders. One of the more recent shifts has been a focus onto strategies around the environmental, social and corporate governance, ESG, and in which the Republic Group is actively involved. Understanding the growing importance of the role of the organization within the societies we serve has allowed us to position ourselves as more than just a bank. Republic Bank's enrollment in 2020 into the United Nations Principles of Responsible Banking places the bank squarely as an active player in relation to the social issues facing the Caribbean, as well as in the fight against climate change. Our governance is evolving to support these initiatives and the result is an institution which is a true participant in the markets in which the bank operates. This in turn yields value beyond the financial definition, beyond financial cycles, and for the benefit of a wider group of stakeholders. In this context, we see governance as having evolved beyond the accountability, the traditional accountability found within systems and structures to building upon these to facilitate doing the right thing at all times and because it is the right thing to do. Resilience, sustainability, in value creation and integrity continue to be the characteristics which define good governance and which today are more significant than ever. It is for these reasons, and as we all look ahead and beyond the pandemic, the Republic Group is extremely honored to collaborate with the CCGI in its message on the importance and value of governance to all entities within the Caribbean. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly, for those, those remarks, which are very fitting to this afternoon's event and this afternoon's discussions. I would now like to call on our chairman, Mr. Nigel Romano, to deliver greetings on behalf of the Institute. Nigel is a yes. long-standing member and director of the Institute and was appointed our chairman January 2020. He's a banker and chartered accountant with extensive experience in public accounting and banking across the globe. He's also a seasoned director and chairman of both public company boards as well as nonprofit organizations. As applies to us all who serve on the Institute's board, Nigel is a passionate person when it comes to corporate governance. Nigel. Thank you, Faye. Uh, good evening, good afternoon. And I'd like to thank uh, Professor King, Professor Garrett, um, Professor Kuhneman, and Alison for joining us. I'm, I'm sure it's, it's quite late where you are, so thank you again very much. I'd also like to thank all our attendees today. Um, today we're going to hear about value and value creation. And of course, in any conversation about value, you have to ask two questions. Of value to whom? and for what? 
And in a, in a time of massive change, massive disruption, um, some of it had accelerated as a result of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, bringing problems, but also bringing opportunities to a lot of people. In fact, I think what COVID has done is brought us a lot closer together and in a, in a much more convenient way. Now we have multiple platforms in which to connect. And, and Zoom, of course, is, is, is just one of them. And the ability to have this uh, governance week with some very, very, very important topics, the role of the corporate secretary, uh, governance in the private sector, and as subs of that, governance in family-owned businesses, and governments in our uh, governance in in conglomerates and of course governance in the private sector which has its own issues which uh, professor file will take us to, take us through uh, so i'm looking forward to a very engaging week um i i i i i, I want to believe that i approach most situations with a certain amount of humility and curiosity because my objective is, is, is more to learn and to improve than to, to, to dominate. So I'm really looking forward to this week and I want to thank all of you for joining us. And uh, without further ado, I want to hand it over back to Faith to introduce Professor. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, Nigel. It is now my immense pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Mervyn King who will give a feature opening address for this governance week. Professor Mervyn King is a senior counsel and former judge of the Supreme Court of South Africa. He is Professor Extraordinaire at the University of South Africa on Corporate Citizenship, Honorary Professor at the Universities of Pretoria and Cape Town, and a visiting professor at Rhodes. He is currently a professor at the Wits Business School at the University of Witswatersrand. He has an honorary doctorate of laws from the universities of Witswatersrand in South Africa and leads in the UK, an honorary doctorate from Deakin University, Melbourne, Australia, and an honorary doctorate in commerce from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. He's chair emeritus of the King Committee on Corporate Governance in South Africa, which produced King one, two, three, and four, and chair of the Good Law Foundation. He is Chair Emeritus of the International Integrated Reporting Council in London and of the Global Reporting Initiative in Amsterdam and a member of the Private Sector Advisory Group to the World Bank on Corporate Governance. He chaired the United Nations Committee of Eminent Persons on Governance and Oversight and was President of the Advertising Standards Authority for 15 years and a member of the ICC Court of Arbitration in Paris for seven years. He's chair of the African Integrated Reporting Council and chair of the Integrated Reporting Committee of South Africa. He has received lifetime achievement awards for promoting quality corporate governance globally from the IGN, the Asian Center for Corporate Governance, the Indian Institute of Directors and the Regenesis Business School. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and Commerce. Honorary fellow, fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, of the Institute of Internal Auditors of the UK, of the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, of the Certified Public Accountants of Australia, of the Chartered Institute for Public, of Public Relations of the UK, of the Chartered Secretaries and Administrators, and a Chartered Director of South Africa. He is the patron of a Good Governance Academy currently housed in the Wits Business School in Parktown Ridge, which holds colloquia on critical governance issues and distributes a memorandum to, two, to over two million members of local and international institutions. He has been chair, director, and chief executive of several companies listed on the London, Luxembourg, and Johannesburg stock exchanges. He has consulted, advised, and spoken on legal, business, advertising, sustainability and corporate governance issues in over 60 countries and has received many awards from international bodies around the world, including the World Federation of Stock Exchanges and the International Federation of Accountants. 
is the author of five books on governance, sustainability and reporting, the latest being the auditor, Quo Maris. He also sits as an arbitrator and mediator internationally. Professor King will be joining us from South Africa, where it is now some moments after 9 p.m. So we are deeply grateful that he has made himself available to us despite this late hour, and we eagerly anticipate his sharing with us some of his views and thoughts on our theme for this week. He will present on the topic, Enterprise Value Creation. Professor King. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, um, Ms. Collimo. Um, um, greetings to old friends and people with whom I've shared platforms around the world. Um, I have spoken and worked in many countries around the world. And as chairman of the United Nations on Governance and Oversight, it's also taken me to many places around the world. Um, I say this not out of self-praise, but to indicate to you that I speak from both an academic background as a very senior corporate lawyer and also a practical background because I've been the chairman and directors and non-executive director of companies in the UK, in Europe, and in South Africa. So I sit here in my library and uh, talking to you, but I'm covered in corporate scars because those of you in business and uh, Kimberly, if I may call you by your first name, from the Republic Bank, I've been chairman and uh, an executive director of banks. And uh, I'm fully aware of the duties that the director has, especially in the financial sector. It's an onerous task. But it, I believe that people become non-executive directors. When they're successful, they do it, they give back to society, for society enabling them to be successful. Because nowhere in the world, I believe, does a non-executive director get fully compensated for taking on a task that puts his personal estate and reputation at risk. And uh, you make a contribution back to society for being successful. I've been successful as a corporate lawyer, as a business person, and um, for the last 27, 28 years, I focused on giving back to society through corporate governance. So um, thank you, um, Faye, if I might call you by your first name, um, for that very detailed introduction. I think you know much more about me than I know about you. <laughs> But uh, I'm delighted to meet you, even though it's virtual. And um, I do have some slides tonight. And in those slides, I'm going to take you back to pre-first uh, Industrial Revolution, then the Industrial Revolution. And what happened to the formation of a company limited with limited liability and the impact it's had during the 20th century and then into the 21st century and the way we are today. So could I have the slides which I have sent to you, please up, share the screen. Right, so see enterprise value creation, but um, you have correctly in the uh, heading to your webinar this evening, this afternoon, talked about value creation. But you will see as I progress through this talk this evening that enterprise, the word enterprise has been added to value creation. And an enterprise, if you look it up in the Oxford Dictionary, for example, or Wikipedia, or Google it, it means the business firm. So value creation to business, what is that? So 
Let me have the first slide. Next slide, please. So I told you I'm going to take you back and take you on a journey. In the 17th and 18th century, there were entities, but they had unlimited liability. Wealthy families gave capital, which was really risk capital, because if a business failed, they were still liable to the creditors and to the employees. And so started a conversation which moved into the middle of the 19th century. Should we, the government of the day, representing the people in the United Kingdom, and also the discussion was in Massachusetts, in the United States, should we create an artificial person and give that artificial person limited liability? Next slide, please. Well, there was at the time much opposition to this, especially from theologians. So Lord Thurlow was a well-known theologian at the time. And exactly in 1844, he said the following, who are we as mankind and ladies present in those days, it was mankind and not humankind. Who are we as mankind to believe that we can create a person that has no mind, no heart, and no conscience. He was correct, Lord Thurlow. Because when the government of the day representing society created this artificial person, they created also an incapacitated person. It has no mind, heart, mind, soul, or conscience. When something goes wrong, and it does always, there are valleys and peaks in the business world. That's why I said, I have corporate scars, and that's how we learn. Um, we go through these peaks and valleys, but um, when wealthy families today or wealthy person or a financial institution such as Republic Bank um, takes equity in an IPO, initial public offering. They subscribe for shares, for a share in the company. Now, through the corporate architecture, shareholders appoint the directors. And these wealthy families were the shareholders. And of course, they appointed members of their families as directors. And so the primacy of the shareholder started developing in the last half of the 19th century. And this concept that the shareholders were the owners of the company became a common conversation. And it was believed that you were actually working for these shareholders, as if the company didn't exist. But of course, there was a focus then on increasing the wealth of shareholders, and there was a focus on financial capital, as if intellectual capital, human capital, natural capital, all the other resources we use and the relationships with our stakeholders we're in silos away from financial capital. Well, next slide, please. The primacy of the shareholders was reinforced into the 20th century, when in the state of Michigan, the Ford Motor Company Limited, that had a very successful product called the Model T Ford, and in 1919 made excessive profits, $65 million, which was a lot of money, probably $6.5 billion today. Henry Ford, who I believe was the pioneer of inclusive capital, because if you listen what happened, as chair, chair he said, I'm going to take this excessive profit and use it to improve the plant and machinery to produce more effectively our model T Ford. And I'm going to increase the wages of employees. 
to encourage them to work longer hours and even sometimes some weekends to meet the demand for our product. The Dodge brothers, who were then a minority shareholder and later became a competitor, said you cannot do that. We as the shareholders are the owners of the company. And we are the primary stakeholder. You should use that to declare a special dividend to the shareholders before you start increasing wages of employees. The board of the Ford Motor Company Limited refused and said they would continue to increase the wages of employees. The Dodge brothers went to court and got an injunction, an interdict, as we call it, um, to stop this and the court directed the majority of that profit to be paid as a special dividend to shareholders. Can you imagine a Supreme Court in any country, in Trinidad, and I've been to Trinidad, I've been to several of your islands. Um, any court today making an order like that, it would be an outrage to society see how society has changed. But in those days, there was a focus on the shareholder and a focus on success being equated with three criteria, increased profit, increased share price, and increased dividends. If you achieved those three things, you were a successful company, even if that bottom line was being subsidized by society and the environment. And next slide, please. We know the turn into the 20, 20th century, that by the end of the 20th century, we had reached ecological overshoot, which is the technical term for the fact that by 1995 to 97, it was empirically established that we, and in the main limited liability companies, because it's the chosen medium through which business is conducted, we're using and are still using natural assets faster than nature is regenerating them. Clearly not a sustainable matter. And the myth, myth that shareholders were the owners of the company was absolutely debunked during the latter half of the 20th century. Shareholders have no rights to possess the company's assets, to use the company's assets, to manage the business of the company. That's the directors and senior management. They can't take any income of the company. The only way they can receive money from the company is if the board decides to declare a dividend and there's sufficient liquidity to pay that dividend. If there is winding up or liquidation of the company, of course, of corporate failure, business judgment call that goes wrong, shareholders, the concomitant of having no liability to creditors or to employees or any other stakeholder, is that the shareholder is at the back of the queue on the ranking. And only if there's a residue of the paying creditors in their ranking, preferred, secured, preferent, etc. Only if there's a residue do shareholders get a dividend. And you all know that on liquidation, shareholders very seldom get any res res residual payment at all. Of course, if the shareholder is a financial institution or a pension fund, it's more evident as a pension fund, I'm going to take it as Kimberley's pension fund. <laughs> if I'm a trustee of Kimberley's pension fund, I have a duty to Kimberley to make sure, to the best of my ability, that I'm investing in the equity of a company for her, They're where the board has focused on the long term health of the company instead of the wealth of shareholders or any other stakeholders. So, but that is different. As Kimberley shareholder, when I decide to invest in the equity of a company listed, let's say, on the New York Stock Exchange, that pension fund owes no duty to that company, no responsibility to that company. And when something goes wrong, the company is always innocent because it's totally incapacitated, the same as a 
five-year-old child, if you were the guardian of a five-year-old child, something goes wrong, you would have the responsibility and the corporate leaders have that responsibility. And the wrath of society must not turn against the company, it must turn against its directors and senior management. Next slide, please. So the era of corporate leaders, something discussed with the late Professor Stark and Professor Pan of Harvard, and she wrote that brilliant article in the Harvard Business Review, that um, Milton Friedman was not correct when he said that directors should follow the dictate of the shareholders who the owners of the company. That was in 1970. And so the primacy of the shareholder was still in the minds of thought leaders. And for that, he got a laureate prize. Well, he was wrong with respect to the deceased because many of the companies he was speaking about were making the profit and increasing their profit, which he said was the duty, but being subsidized by society and the environment. And the time had come to challenge the maximizing of shareholder value at any cost. And it actually distracted boards from building the company's long-term health. Because the following statement I'm going to make, please remember, if the collective mind of a board gets it right to make a business judgment call, which is positive for the long-term health of the company, it's for the long-term benefit of all its stakeholders, without giving primacy to any particular stakeholder. Next slide, please. And the Ocean Termo, and financial analytic firm in the US, started analyzing companies listed on the S&P 500. And you will all know that iconic companies are listed on that stock exchange. And this is a most fascinating slide because you'll see what is gold, and I hope it's come through as gold, you can see it, are the intangible assets which do not appear on a balance sheet according to financial reporting standards, be they US GAAP or IFRS standards. So let's go back to 1975 and Mr. Milton, Professor Milton Friedman said that the sole purpose of the company is to make profit. Let's have a look. 17% only was so-called intangible assets, such as the reputation of the company. But by the 1980s, there was a realization in the world that there'd been environmental degradation. And you will all remember, some of you will remember, old enough to remember, that in 1983, through the United Nations, the World Commission was held, chaired by Brundtland, former Prime Minister of Sweden. Bob will remember it well. And um, the Brundtland Commission, as it became known, worked from 1983 to 1987 and said that for sustainable development in a resource-constrained world, environmentally degraded, there are three critical factors, the economy, society, and the environment. And they have to be thought of on an integrated basis, 1987. So there was suddenly a realization from providers of capital be they pension funds, banks, or insurance companies. So well, really, the money in the public bank is not the public's money. It's the money of the depositors. And banks don't have money. They have debits and credits. <laughs> um, so the providers of capital started thinking, well, well, hang on a second, there is more importance. And by the late 90s, you will see that only 32% of the market cap of companies listed on that stock exchange, the number of shares in issue times the market price, was represented as additives in a balance sheet according to US generally accepted accounting principles for most of the companies listed on the S&P 500. By the move into the 21st century, it moved to 20%. 
And the last analysis was done in December 2020, right at the end of the first year of our pandemic. It had moved to only 10%, the rest are the so-called intangible assets. But you will see that the ESG space, as it became known, was becoming more and more important. As the world became filled with realization that could we have infinite growth in a finite world? Not an easy question to answer. And the answer seems to be in the negative. And that's a frightening thought. We talk about climate change, which is very important to save the planet. I want to give you an assurance tonight, and I, I haven't got a, I can't rub a genie out or anything, but I'll tell you what, in a million years, planet Earth will still be here in the galaxy. The critical question is whether Homo sapiens will be on that planet. That's the question. And that's a question for directors of these incapacitated persons that are so critical to the creation of capital, the creation of jobs in our developed world and our developed world. Next slide, please. So we move from Professor Friedman's free economy. I always say when I talk and I lecture to students, there's anything free about him. The only thing free about his free economy was the subsidization from society and the environment. 21st century, we started looking at things differently. We started looking at value. What was really the value? And you've heard this saying that uh, society is the licensor of the company. Well, that's an understatement. Society was the creator of the company because the governments that passed the legislation were the representatives of society. They created for society. So historically, we looked at book value, the difference between total assets and total liabilities. Was the book value greater or less than the market value of companies listed on the CAC, Frankfurt, Johannesburg, New York, London, Stock Exchange, wherever it was? Was the present value of discounted future cash flow as positive? You see, everything was being looked at through a financial lens. Next slide, please. But value today, the critical question is not how much money is the company made. The critical question is how has the company made its money? Has it made it at your expense? What are the positive and negative impacts on the triple aspects of a company's business model and outputs, financial, social, and environmental? Does the company have a business model which actually enhances these positive impacts from its activities and its product or service that it renders? Has it in its business model got a strategy also developed which eradicates or ameliorates the negative impacts on these three critical dimensions for sustainable development enunciated in 1987? Have sustainability issues been embedded into the business model? Has the company, through the, its mind, the board, identified the critical sustainable development goals published in 2015, pertinent to the business of the company, into its business model? Conversely, what were the impacts, have been the impacts of the economy, environment, society on the company itself? So you have impacts on financial condition, operating performance, and risk profile. You have financial reports, the annual financial statement, which are resilient, filled with rigor and consistency. In the ESG space, which became more and more important, as you saw from that slide, many framework providers and standard setters entered that space. There was clutter and confusion for preparers. And for users, comparability became diluted. As chairman of the International Integrated Reporting Council, I, with my colleagues, arranged the corporate reporting dialogue where we try to get these framework providers and standard setters in a room together to try and harmonize these standards. 
to remove this clutter and confusion so that I representing Kimberley, sorry, Kimberley's pension fund could with greater information compare company X to company Y and on a more informed basis make the decision, no, it's at Kimberley's best long-term interest that I invest in company X. So integrated thinking, to think of these things as actually the resources used by a company and its relationships with its stakeholders and the stakeholders' relationships with the company have always been integrated. As stated by Brundtland in 1987, just sort of went over everybody's heads. But we have to connect, integrate the significant financial matters and the significant sustainability matters that come out of sustainability reports or as they will be known, as you will see in a moment, the International Sustainability Standards Board Standards. So the qu critical question, has there been value added to the enterprise that's through one lens? And what have been the impacts to society and the environment? So next slide, please. So in developing the IR framework, which was published in December 20. Uh, 13. The IRC was formed in 2010. It took us three years talking to iconic companies and academics and uh, very experienced chartered accountants and corporate lawyers around the world. We said there were six major resources or capitals that are used by companies around the world. Financial, manufacturing, plant and machinery, human capital, people, intellectual capital, IP, natural capital, the natural assets, and social capital, the relationship between the company and stakeholders. Next slide. And there was a value creation process. You had these inputs into the company, which is the blue circle there. You've got the activities in the company making its product. That's an output. But you have an output as well, such as waste, the other outputs. And the product you'll see is still in the company, but that product goes out and starts impacting on those resources and impacting to summarize those resources on the economy, on society and the environment. And it has outcomes. So if you take that great company, the Coca-Cola company, 120 years old, and suddenly in the US there were allegations that the reason for the obesity of children in the US was Coca-Cola. And some countries slapped a tax on Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola rethought that for 128 years, I think it was at that stage, that they'd focused on the brand. It was the most valuable brand in the world until Apple took, took that spot. But Coca-Cola announced, we will not advertise to children under the age of 12. We will arrange activities for children under 12 at all our bottling plants. We will make sure that we will make a Coca-Cola that has no sugar, no calories in it. And Coca-Cola light was developed. And so the mindsets were starting to change even in companies that were more than 100 years old. Next slide, please. So integrated thinking became the dictate of the day. Every com company is dependent on relationships with its stakeholders and the sources of value creation. You have, and I use the musical term symphony. It's a symphony of these resources and relationships. The board has to learn and understand the legitimate needs, interests and expectations and I add concerns because of the pandemic of its stakeholders. And only when you understand this, can you actually have an informed oversight over management's proposals about strategy, for example. And you need this to make a business judgment call in the long-term best interest of the health of the company. There are greater stakeholder expectations than ever before because of social media. There should be agenda items at each board meeting of any business, any company, 
whatever the business is, agriculture, financial, technical, whatever the business is, inputs to outcomes. Does the board actually understand what the outcomes are of its product or its service when it goes out to society? What are the relationships with your stakeholders? There are many concerns that stakeholders have had through the pandemic. IT governance and cybersecurity, absolutely critical because cybersecurity is one of the risks to business alongside climate change. We've learned that through supply chains, a major company listed on the London Stock Exchange, if it has a major service provider, for example, that is using child labor, if that becomes known, the company would lose 40% of its market cap the next day on the stock exchange. And you should have an agenda item risks and opportunities of climate change. Tomorrow I'm speaking at a climate change conference. And it's absolutely critical that the board's mind is directed with an agenda item. What are the risks and opportunities that this company, the business of this company, can suffer or seize an opportunity because of climate change? And that's a reality. This next slide, please. So the more informed reports are, the more transparent your accountability as a board. So directors owe their duties to the company, this incapacitated artificial person that has no heart, mind, soul, or conscience. You as a director are the conscience of the company. The tragedy of this concept of the primacy of the shareholder and the three criteria of profit, increased share price, and increased dividends was that we had a century of unsustainable development because we ended the century going into the 21st century with natural assets being used faster than they were being regenerated. Clearly not sustainable. Next slide, please. So sustainability reporting became very important. And in the turn into the 21st century, 80% of issues were sustainability issues and only 20% were financial issues. And so IFAC, the International Federation of Accountants, arranged a meeting at the United Nations where I was present. And international institutions such as the World Bank, um, uh, other great institutions around the world, were invited to that meeting, Chatham House rules, nothing goes outside the room. But we discussed that we are doing annual reports in trying to discharge our duty of accountability to the company and through the company to all its stakeholders by just doing the financial statements according to certain standards. And yet the makeup of the market cap was at that stage, 80% wasn't appearing as an additive in a balance sheet. So clearly we were not discharging our duty of accountability, but that space was becoming more and more important. I said at that meeting, yes, it's becoming more and more important, but without the numbers, it's not meaningful. And what people are now doing, they're reporting in two silos. We've got to connect, we've got to integrate the two. And the discussion progressed. Do we connect or do we integrate? The word integrate won <laughs> the discussion. But other framework providers, as I've said, already entered the space and there was clutter and confusion. Next slide, please. So there was a cry suddenly for an international sustainability standards board, the same as we have an international accounting standards board under the IFRS. The EC advisory group, meanwhile, was redesigning and are now going into the 2020 during the pandemic. The CRD had for four years plodded along and wasn't very successful in getting these framework providers and standard setters to agree to harmonization of standards, to try and make comparability more meaningful. And they were all dealing with the same public interest issues. In March 2019, at a conference in London, um, as then chair, now chair emeritus of the IRC, I was the speaker and I had fortunately in front of me, most executives of what I call the alphabet soup, GRI, there are all the acronyms, which you all know. 
And so I took the opportunity to say it's a social outrage that you have formed your association, your nonprofit organization, on, on these issues which are of importance to the world and to people around the world, but you see yourselves as competitors when you're all dealing with the same issues. Well, I also pointed out to them that the most important sustainable development goal was 17, which was collaboration, and you should be collaborating. Well, it took the scientists during the pandemic to show what SDG 17 actually meant, the collaboration to within nine months develop a vaccine, which usually took five to nine years to develop. IOSCO, the entity that actually controls stock exchanges around the world in effect, has agreed that there should be collaboration. The World Economic Forum worked with the big four accounting firms to develop metrics on this. The Financial Reporting Council in the UK said, yes, there should be separate reports, but companies must report on sustainability issues. The International Federation of Accountants said there should be an international sustainability board sitting alongside the International Accounting Standards Board under the oversight of the IFRS. The IFRS then issued a consultation paper to close at the end of December 2020. Should we increase our mandate, not only financial reporting, but also sustainability reporting? And the overwhelming response was yes. Next slide, please. So, the, at the moment, this collaboration led to talks of merger, and as you probably all know, Sustainability Accounts Standards Board of America, San Francisco, has merged with the IRC. So you have a framework provider, which provides the structure of reporting, and the standard setter, which is the content of your report, merging under the Value Reporting Foundation. And TAS team, as I'm talking to you, is working with the TAS team of the IFRS to start creating and first will create, and we, the Value Reporting Foundation, of which I'm Chair Emeritus, have issued, but two months ago, we issued a prototype of this related financial reporting disclosure and value creation in regard to climate change standards. Next slide, please. So the wheel will not be reinvented in the ISSB, but uh, we'll learn from all these people who thought they were competitors and our collaborators. Sustainability, like a coin, has two sides. The Global Reporting Initiative saw it through the Brundtland eyes. What were the activities and the products impacts on those three critical dimensions, the economy, society, and the environment. Meanwhile, we started learning, particularly in the second half of the decade, second decade of the 21st century. We learned from the GFC and the collapse of Lehman Brothers, for example, that the economy could have a huge impact on limited liability companies, that society could have a huge impact on limited liability companies. I'll give one example, coronavirus. That environment could have a huge impact on limited liability companies, climate change. Different purposes, different audiences. But you will see, we were looking now at sustainability issues through a value creation lens, hence the addition of the word enterprise value creation. And could we create a national body, an international body with consistency, reliability, rigor, and improve comparability as we have with financial reporting. Next slide, please. So enterprise value creation, the impacts of the economy, the environment, society on the company, its financial condition, its balance sheet, its operating performance, its income statement and cash flow, its risk profile, its cost of capital. If you look at the statement of collaboration of the five uh, um, value creating entity standard setters and framework providers that have collaborated, CPD, CDSB, IRC, SASB, and uh, the GRI. Well, 
the EC was talking about non-financial reporting directives. About six weeks ago, they came out with corporate sustainability reporting directives. And only a few days ago said, we will try and align these with the standards that are going to come out to the International Sustainability Standards Board, which will be announced in November of this year at Glasgow at the Climate Change Summit. And the endeavor of the ISSB and the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directors is to work with the IASSB, the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, to get assurance-friendly language so we can have reliable assurance, reasonable assurance of sustainability reports and integrated reports. So we look at enterprise value creation, preservation, because sometimes we have a business model that's actually eroding value. Well, we need to account for all that. Next slide, please. So value today in, has to be looked at through both these lenses. And we believe, I believe, and I'm speculating what's going to come out of the merger and it's going to come out of the ISSB, where we have teams working as I'm speaking to you, will be a focus on enterprise value lens. In other words, looking at how the economy, society, and the environment impacts on the limited liability company. But the limited liability company could still, of course, look at how its activities or its product is impacting on those three critical dimensions for sustainable development. In summary, as Tim Moen, the former chief executive of the GRI said, um, the first lens is looking how the company's activities and product impacts on the world. The enterprise value creation lens looks at how the world is impacting on the company. But they both are important. Next slide, please. So, Enterprise value creation, I say versus sustainability reporting, but they are related. Sustainability related financial disclosure standards would enable disclosure of how sustainability matters create or erode enterprise value. This type of reporting is different from sustainability reporting, which looks at the activities or the product's impact on those three critical dimensions. Next slide, please. So, what we're striving for, we all operating in this thought leadership around the world, and the SEC of America has now only uh, a couple of weeks ago said, no, we must start looking at sustainability reporting. And I'm using my words, but I'm paraphrasing what their statement was. Not reinvent the wheel. We must learn the lessons that these other framework providers and standard setters have learned over the last few decades in the world. So these drivers of connection between sustainability performance and financial risk and return, climate change, and the global pandemic has actually driven this collaboration. And these two drivers have created a sense of urgency to establish this International Sustainability Standards Board as a stepping stone to a globally accepted comprehensive corporate reporting system, which would make the life of directors much easier, not less onerous, but much easier, because you have one standard. For preparers and users, it makes a lot of sense. Next slide, please. So enterprise value is value created for others as well. So in the IR framework, we say, providers of financial company are also interested in the value an organization creates for others. When it affects the ability of the organization to create value for itself. No? You take account of the needs, interests, expectations, concerns of stakeholders, but always make a decision of the best interests of the company. That will mean that from time to time, one stakeholder will be benefited more than another. And that's why they trade offs between stakeholders. So companies in the EU, 
by 2035, they don't want a fossil fuel driven motor cars, fossil fuel plant machinery. It takes money to change to renewables. Some companies have said for the next three years, we're not declaring a dividend to shareholders because we want to use that cash and maintain our debt equity ratio, use that cash to change to, to renewables. One would think the share price would drop, but the share price of some of these companies has gone up because asset managers like BlackRock said, here's a board that's applied its mind to the long-term health of this company. And I owe a duty to my beneficiaries, all the $7.3 billion that they have available for investment. Uh, I have a duty to them to make sure I'm investing in the equity of a company that's got longevity. Next slide, please. So we are in a changed world. We've moved from profit at any cost to value creation, preservation, or noticing the erosion. So these standards are pertinent and they have to be connected. Integrated thinking, integrated reporting is becoming more essential than ever. And all these bodies I've been talking about, IFAC, the World Bank, um, Value Reporting Foundation, the IFRS have all recognized that these things have to be connected and integrated thinking and reporting is absolutely critical. So a board must spend more time understanding these reports, understanding the financials, take out the significant material matters and state it not in IFRS speak, which is incomprehensible to the vast majority of users, not in ISSB speak, which will be from November, you'll have ISSB speak, because words like ecological overshoot just run off the tongue, you know, of those dealing with sustainability issues. But in clear, concise, and understandable language, so people can understand it and make an informed assessment about a company. Reporting is the lifeblood of accountability. And if we can get it right, then people are more informed, particularly the providers of capital, which are people walking in the streets in Trinidad, New York, London, Johannesburg. Next slide, please. So that's my famous octopus, which I've showed around the world. In the tentacles of the octopus are things you have to do. You mandated, for example, to do an AFS according to IFRS standards in your part of the world. You may, in some countries, there's mandated to follow the TCFD, Financial Disclosure on Climate Change. Whatever you have to do, so sustainability reports, most companies today do sustainability reports. So that's all online. And you must be careful of all the information coming into a company through the net because knowledge gets lost in this mass of information. Directors have to make sure they really understand this. In the head of the octopus is your annual integrated report where you tell the story of your company and how your business model has got embedded in it at the SDGs pertinent to the business of the company. And why, as a matter of probability, you have got a business model which is going to result in the long-term health of the company. So I end by repeating what is attributed to be a statement by Winston Churchill. Some people say it's attributed to others, but I like the attribution to Winston Churchill. In the last three weeks, three weeks before the end of the Second World War, or he wrote a four-page letter to his wife. And in the last sentence, he said, if I'd had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. And that's what we as directors have to do, spend more time understanding these things, really understanding and able to explain it in clear, concise, and understandable language. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. But I think your presentation has certainly given us here quite a lot to think about and a lot to chew on in our upcoming panel discussion. We're really grateful for those, those very uh, thought-broking um, comments and slides. And I think we can now move on to, to introduce our panel so that we can, we can start this discussion. Our panelists will comprise Professor Frank Kuhnemann, 
Mr. Richard Rambaran, Ms. Camille Facey, and the session will be moderated by our chairman, Mr. Nigel Raman. Before commencing the panel discussion, I would just like to take the opportunity to introduce formally our panelists. Professor Frank Kuhnemann is an authority in the international field of corporate governance. He is an experienced director and supervisory director, having held positions at several businesses and organizations, including Deutsche Bank, Finance, NB, Integrated Utility Holding, NB, Maduro and Couriers Bank, NB, and the Public Sector Accountants Bureau Federation Foundation. As a result, he's able to scale back complex legal issues to practical solutions for executive boards and board members. He's also a certified super di supervisory director in the Netherlands. Mr. Richard Rambaran is another member of our panel. He's currently the executive director of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Guyana. He's also an assistant professor in the Department of Economics, University of Guyana a senior economic and financial specialist of Project Development Consultancy, a market research company, and he's a fellow of the Young Scholars Initiative, Institute of New Economic Thinking, New York. He has a multidimensional career, having worked as a research analyst at the Private Sector Commission of Guyana, an economic researcher on the Caribbean Local Economic Devel Development Fund Program on Global Affairs, in Canada, a researcher at the University of Hyderabad in India, and an economic and financial analyst of the Ministry of Finance, Guyana. He has also consulted for several private sector companies and has been the recipient of the Commonwealth Scholarship and the Organization of American States Scholarship. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics, a Master's of Business Administration, a Master of Arts in Economics, along with several certificates from the IMF, Center for Latin American Monetary Studies, United Nations, among others. Fields such as macroeconomic stability, financial programming, debt sustainability development, effectiveness evaluation, and sustainable growth. The third member of our panel is Ms. Camille Facey, who is an attorney at law and the managing partner of the law firm Facey Law, where she specializes in company and commercial law, corporate governance, telecommunications, Conveyancing Trusts and Estates. Currently chair of the newly established Building Practitioners Board. Camille also serves on the boards of the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce, the Spectrum Management Authority, Youth Region Youth, and the National Solid Waste Management Authority, where she chairs the Corporate Governance Committee. She also serves as a member of the Corporate Governance Committee of the ESOG, is one of the advisors to small business in the JBDC Accelerator Program, and is a member of the Commercial Law Committee of Jamaica Bar Association. She's passionate about corporate governance and delivers corporate, gov corporate law and governance training for the Jamaica Stock Exchange, the PSOJ, the JBDC, and her own recently formed company, Facey Corporate Services. I would now like to invite our chairman, Mr. Nigel Romano, to take the floor as moderator for the panel discussion. Thank you, Faye, and thank you, Professor King. That was a, a very stimulating uh, presentation. Um, before I, intro before I, I, I hand it over to the panelists, I just wanted to, to highlight what I thought or what, 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 what to me were the highlights. One, how much of market value today is more about intangible assets as opposed to tangible assets. For me, that was, that was very, very significant because the accounting, traditional accounting is definitely not capturing the true value of companies on, on, the, on the historical balance sheet. Also very, also very interesting, and I know there is a, a move towards companies making sure there is Purpose and that they are providing value. What what um what 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 Professor King talked about the the value being the impact of the company on the society and and for me the corollary to that how much of that value that the company is creating is it able to capture 
the impact on the company of, of, of society. But for me, the, the, the really critical one was limited liability companies are seriously incapacitated. There is no mind, no heart, and no conscience. And, and therefore, leadership, the board, is, is responsible for that. So having said that, I'm going to hand it over first to Camille, and then I'm going to introduce the gentleman. So Camille, I'm, I'm giving you the floor. You know, hi, good afternoon, good day, good night. I was seriously hoping that I was not going to be coming directly after Professor King. You know, I think it is very unfair. Professor King, that was brilliant. I want to thank you for that presentation. But beyond that, I want to thank you for your leadership in this area, which you have led the world and the world has benefited. I thought I would share with the audience this afternoon in Jamaica, day, wherever we are, what steps we have taken in Jamaica and what we have been doing to try to embed governance in Jamaica. So Jamaica launched its first private sector corporate governance code in 2006. Now, if you know Jamaicans, you know we don't like to feel that we are missing out on anything. As we say here, if it's egg, we in the red. So the world having had its financial crisis, we thought that we should do the same. And so in the 1990s, we duly, the latter part of the 1990s, we duly had our own financial sector crisis, which resulted in the government having to intervene with public funds to shore up the financial sector. The sector meltdown was started, I think, because of one poorly governed bank and the contagion spread throughout the financial sector and the harm that was caused, we are still suffering from today. Coming out of that crisis, the PSOJ, the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica, was established, um, sorry, the, it established a corporate governance committee in 2001. And that corporate governance committee produced our first Jamaican corporate governance code in 2006. We've had revisions in 2009 and in 2016, and our third revision is now underway. And a lot of it is based on the King Code 4. So we want to thank you again for your leadership and for sharing with the world because we are learning from all that is being done in South Africa and elsewhere, the UK, wherever else in the world that governance is being propelled and practiced. Now in Jamaica, we don't just have our private sector code, which is applicable to listed companies. We also have a public sector code which was launched in 2012. And I would like to share a personal story which demonstrates the transformative power of governance because very often in Jamaica, and I don't know if that is as prevalent elsewhere, persons don't quite grasp that these principles are living principles that can transform an organization and that will have a positive societal value or a positive value on the enterprise. So I was point, appointed to a board called the National Solid Waste Management Authority. There had been a terrible fire that encompassed the whole of Kingston and surrounding areas for about three weeks. And the society was in an uproar and the board was changed and new persons were brought on. When I went on this board, the audited financial statements were nine years behind. There was rampant fraud and theft, waste of resources, and obviously demotivated staff. I mean, the staff were worried that working at this organization would ne negatively impact their career prospects. 
there were when you went into the board meeting and you inquired about the assets uh, on the books, you were told that, oh, the asset is on the book, but it's actually non-existent. The financials that came were not credible. So, of course, we said, well, we have to get proper records. But that was easier said than done because computers had been stolen. There had been fires over the years. And what wasn't destroyed by the fire was destroyed by the water when they tried to put out the fire. So clearly, <laughs> managing this kind of organization was just impossible. Governance, what's that? Major auditing firms who we asked to come in to try and audit declined this opportunity. So fast forward five years, and where are we today? Today, we have our up-to-date 2019-2020 audited accounts, which are unqualified and laid in parliament. And our 2021 audit is now underway. We were awarded first place in our 2020 public sector awards in the category of corporate governance practices and procedures, and we ranked in the top five overall. Our staff no longer worry about career damage. They proudly wear their shirts and go the extra mile in our very cash-strapped organization to ensure that every dollar can be accounted for and that the public is getting value from our organization. And I have shared this because what we used were the principles of governance, starting with tone at the top that was set by the board, the accountability, the transparency. It is those principles as embedded in the King Code and in our own corporate governance codes in Jamaica that were used to transform this organization. So recognizing I could not come near the scholarship that Professor King has brought, I thought I would share with you how we have used governance in Jamaica to help in transformation. And some of the things we have done in addition to our code has been the establishment of the Corporate Governance Awards, both for private sector and public sector. And there is great competition to have the bragging rights to be the winner of these awards. We have established a corporate governance index, which measures the compliance of our listed companies with the private sector corporate governance code. And we are now trying to develop an index, an index for the public sector, which I think is going to be transformative. On the government side, the government is definitely on board. And by policy, they have now established and implemented a number of the governance principles. So gender diversity is baked in. So we have to have 30% of either sex boards. There have to be board competency profiles that ensure that the persons who are appointed to the boards are not just the friends of politicians, but they have the competencies that are required for that particular board. A database is being established with fit and proper persons from which the entities will draw their directors. There are caps on the number of board positions that can be held, capping it at three to avoid overboarding and capping the number of chairmanships that each person can have. And one third of the board has to be retained even if administrations change to ensure that there is continuity and institutional memory because we had a situation where you would have a new administration and the entire board would, would go. And then it's as if we were starting all over. Board evaluations are now mandated. And what is today policy? These have now been converted to regulations and they are currently before parliament. So we still, we've done a lot in Jamaica, but we still have a far way to go. But for sure, Jamaica is on the path to improve governance in both public and private sector to the benefit of the entire nation. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. I mean, <laughs> well, well done. Thank you. I, I thought you were you were much better prepared than you. You you thought you were apparently. Um, so let me hand it over to uh, Professor Kunaman. I have some questions for you after, but let let's hear from Professor Kunaman. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nigel, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Marvin King. It was really very interesting what you described, your presentation. And what you did basically was describing a change in focus, where the focus was on the shareholder and uh, increasing profit for the shareholder. And then the change, the shift was to companies' long term health uh, to create uh, enterprise value, uh, integrative thinking, things that are now uh, pretty common in many countries, as Camille just shared with us, and as we um, experience in a corporate governance institute uh, that organized uh, this event. In many countries, uh, we see this focus change. And what we also have seen in the course of the last years, and maybe that has been accelerated by the COVID-19 crisis, is a shift from internal focus to external focus. Uh, directors and supervisory directors, non-executive directors, they tended to look at internal affairs. How is the company doing? And now we are forced to take into account how our environment is doing, how the world around us is performing, because that greatly influences everything that we do. And at the same time, you see another focus shift from looking in the back mirror, looking back what many directors and supervisory directors unfortunately still do. They look at the annual accounts, they look at a monthly reports, they discuss differences of a few small percentages that really are not important, but they discuss them as if, um, as if their lives depend on it. But what they are learning more and more is look around, uh, look outside the borders of the enterprise, uh, look at the world and also look at the future. And basically that means that as a supervisory director or as a non-executive director, you should uh, pay physically much more time to subjects like uh, stakeholders, um, uh, what is uh, the risk management, what are the factors, not only where we run risk, but also where we have opportunities, strategy, uh, reputation management, all not tangible subjects that generally, in my experience, tend to be avoided. You just have to allocate a big chunk of time of that uh, for each meeting. Then as to integrity, you also see a focus change because we have seen a lot of attention during the course of the last years on codes of conduct, uh, diversity management, uh, gender diversity, uh, like Camille mentioned, uh, the tone at the top. But what we see now, and that's to me very interesting, and actually I have a, a question or something that I would like to uh, have a Professor King comment on. What you see is that um, the biblical, am I my brother's keeper, uh, more and more is applied to especially globally operating enterprises. Uh, for example, international IT companies like Apple and Google, uh, Facebook, they are not like all companies responsible for their own enterprise, but also what their clients do with their products. And they uh, are being held responsible, accountable and responsible when um, their products are used uh, for, uh, yeah, to prompt violence, or as we have seen with a former um, US president, for example, or when there's hate mail or uh, there's destructive content in, in, in what their clients make use of their products. And the same development we see with uh, banks. Uh, banks provide bank accounts and loans. And um, well, when you have a bank account, you can make deposits and withdrawals. But now in these days, due to international regulation, all banks are being held responsible for compliance, which basically means that they have to take care 
for the integrity of their clients, not only their own internal integrity, but also for the integrity of their clients. And they are being held accountable for that. And we have seen examples of many internationally operating banks who have been fined during the course of the last two years with fines up to one uh, billion US dollars. So uh, that is something to take into account. So you have to take into account the external world and you have to be your brother's keeper. And in this respect, and Professor King also mentioned the international oil industry. Uh, maybe you have read in the papers uh, a very interesting verdict against Shell Oil Company. Uh, I see my picture is frozen. I hope you can hear me. Uh, Shell Oil Company, um, which has been uh, ordered by the court in The Hague um, one month ago, May 26, uh, to slash its CO2, uh, CO2 uh, emissions with 45% in 2030, three zero, compared to 2019. So that is an enormous task. But not only that, they have to do that immediately. They cannot, according to the court order, wait for uh, the appeal. So they have to start now. And what's the most interesting uh, aspect of this verdict from um, uh, point of corporate governance is that they are also being held responsible for the emissions that their and uh, the, the CO2 emissions of their suppliers and of their clients. And of course, Shell defended itself in court by saying, well, we cannot be held responsible for what others do. But court ruled, yes, you are. You are your brother's keeper and we will hold you responsible. So for me, that's very interesting what's happening here, this shift. Mm -hmm. And you see it globally. And there are many interesting aspects and I want to mention two. Um, one of them is that you see that a lot of responsibility for our environment is somehow transferred to these internationally operating enterprises. So governments, they cannot do it apparently, and they don't do it and they leave the responsibility and they even expected responsibility for something that was public affair 20 to 40 years ago, now is a responsibility of these enterprises. And then, and maybe it's possible that Professor King gives a comment on that. What we also see, at least what I see, is that we have many huge democracies now in the world where the idea of democracy is, uh, is being seen as the power of the minority. Whereas uh, you can also view democracy as um, power of the uh, of the majority that takes into account the reasonable interests of the minority. That's a big difference. It's a huge difference. And so we see a lot of presidents, uh, former President Trump, uh, Bolsonaro, Putin, Xi, Erdogan. I can go on and go on. Maduro who seem themselves to act contradictory to all those beautiful focus shifts and things that we expect in the governance of our companies and of internationally operating companies. And somehow it is possible that that will create a tension that's very difficult to manage. So uh, Nigel, uh, there I would like to give the floor to others. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kuhneman. Now I'll take I'll turn it over to Richard Rambaran from Guyana. Richard, it's good to have you here. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. Good afternoon. Or greetings, colleagues. As I'm aware, we're all in different parts of the world. It's certainly a pleasure to be here. I would like to thank the, uh, the Institute for the opportunity once again to be able to speak. Um, like my colleagues who have, who have spoken before me, subsequent to the, uh, the main speaker, Professor King, 
I uh, I too was challenged and 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 struggled to to perhaps understand how I can contribute subsequent to such an eloquent and brilliantly put um, presentation. So I would like to thank him for that uh, presentation. So of course, Professor King made some very uh, interesting contributions and thought provoking uh, statements and and gave some very interesting perspectives on what we've seen to be the development of the firm as well as perhaps mapped into the development of the society. And for me, um, some of these very, for some of these poignant ones include what the, the movement of the, what we see as traditionally being social functions, how these enterprises or how enterprises can internalize uh, the social functions and and how private enterprises actually become or can become responsible for this, for, for many of these traditional social functions. I think, firstly, um, we must be cognizant of the fact that many of the theoretical frameworks that we have been provided with historically are, are birthed out of the social context within which they were located. And thus, traditionally, um, we see many firms, of course, focusing on industrial out, on industrialization, uh, their traditional output and their measurements on their metrics, of course, being linked to that particular context within which they were birthed out of. Now, this, of course, presents us at this juncture in our global history, um, and of course, in the long trajectory of history with an opportunity to be able to revise what we are, uh, how, how we actually view many of these firms. So I was trying to, to, to perhaps conjure up how I could present something of value or make a contribution of, of some value. And I think where I can is perhaps locating the modern Caribbean firm in the current development context um, as we see it. Of course, as you are all well aware, the Caribbean context is a little bit different from other countries given our history, um, given the nature of our industrialization process, um, given our relative uh, exposure to climate change and what we have to lose as Caribbean countries um, in the event that catastrophic climatic conditions are realized. So perhaps we can observe the dichotomies which emerge um, globally in the sense that what considerations, and I'll throw a couple of questions out um, as my contribution to the panel uh, to, be, to be perhaps in some ways provocative. What considerations ought to be made for the carbon enterprises who are in countries that have not been historical emitters of carbon, have not contributed historically, but yet face uh, the real risk of being the recipient of extreme natural disasters, who is the Caribbean's global, the Caribbean's GDP, when juxtaposed alongside the global GDP, it's less than 1%. And thus, um, when one equates that output tantamount to perhaps environmental considerations, it's really, um, something that is, that is negligible, um, our contribution to the historical global emissions. And further to that, what considerations perhaps should be given to larger enterprises um, when compared to MSNEs? And that, of course, we must recognize because naturally in the Caribbean, um, almost all of our firms within a global context are MSMEs and how should we uh, position or rethink um, the location of these firms within this global context. So what does that really mean for us here in the Caribbean? And I think that it gives us a very opportune time to examine perhaps a renewed role for many of the private sector umbrella organizations, because after all, when one moves away from only financial consideration, where does cooperation in particular occur amongst the private sector in contemporary Caribbean, uh, contemporary Caribbean economy? It's of course naturally where their interests converge. 
Um, and that, of course, occurs at many of the private sector umbrella organizations throughout the Caribbean. And recognizing our relative uh, diminutive stature when compared in the global context or when taken in the global context, we must understand that we have to, at a global front, make a much uh, greater drive in a cooperative manner for dimensions that will affect sustainability. Um, like I would have mentioned, many of the environmental considerations, many of the climatic um, considerations that, that will be disastrous in the event that global warming, for example, is not curtailed, will be hinged um, disproportionately on small island developing states, but in particular, um, the Caribbean islands. So those are some of the considerations that we ought to make and how can we utilize uh, institutes such as the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute to be able to transform the culture in the Caribbean, recognizing where we are, recognizing the need for what we, we have to do and how can that be appropriately applied within the global context. Now, naturally, me um, throwing out questions in a provocative way, um, we don't have the answers for the questions, but I think if we approach, um, approach finding the answers using this perhaps, let's say, Socratic method, then we may be a step further to understanding where the Caribbean should be located within this global context. Now, naturally, we don't have uh, the historical emissions uh, the, and, and such the like that go along uh, with these considerations, but there must be some uh, responsibility from our private sector's uh, perspective. Now, that brings us, of course, to the other points where we must be able to cooperate uh, on a healthy cooperation particularly as it relates to what we, what we consider in terms of social malaise. Um, we have, of course, observed, as we would have previously mentioned by speakers, um, the, the impact of private sector advertisements, et cetera, on uh, the health and the well-being of our society. How can we begin to pivot ourselves in the Caribbean to be able to, whether it's more responsible messaging, et cetera, or being able to filter cultures from global uh, actors into the and assimilate it within the Caribbean context. And of course, the same goes for our people. Now, we are very small um, in terms of number in the Caribbean, uh, about 15, 16 million, if one comes the Anglophonic Caribbean. And therefore, we must be cognizant of that and be able to, in recognizing that, utilize our voice as a collective, as opposed to just simply individual, in what is to be seen as a greater thrust in our long development trajectory. So, uh, Nigel, in terms of my contribution, I want to contribute those questions because I would like them to be points um, of provocation for discussion and perhaps set some tone um, over the next five days or even for a subsequent discussion here um, on how in particular the modern Caribbean firm can contribute, can pivot, can adapt its corporate structure and its corporate governance to suit this reality that we face. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. That was excellent. So I'd like to open the conversation first by going back to Camille, and then and then we'll go back to, to, to the professor. Camille, you said that the whole corporate governance code on the private and public sectors in Jamaica was very effective. And the question I had, you said that um, you were able to produce your audited financials in, in, in good time, et cetera. How did the performance of the entity, how did it affect the performance? Audited financials are well and good, but did performance improve? Did the company, was the company able to create value both for its customers, its, the community, 
and its, its shareholders? Yes, Nigel, thank you for that question. We most certainly were. For example, fuel. Fuel was being stolen at an alarming rate. You would have trucks that were parked, meaning not moving. And yet when you checked the logs at the gas station or wherever they, they were taking fuel every day. So taxpayers' money was going down the drain. We were able through internal controls and through putting in proper systems to stem those losses. Mm -hmm. And whereas before, we, that, that company could not credibly sit at the table and say, we need more money to do what we have to do. No, we can, because we have financial statements. We are accounting for every dollar. So we are now at the table, whereas before we were nowhere. So there has been a complete turnaround in the organization. And it's been through systematically putting in proper governance. In fact, our, what, I think it was our last annual report, we titled it Embedding Corporate Governance and Transformation okay. Through Governance. Okay, thank you. Professor, Professor King, the, 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 next, the next question I have is, is, is for you. Um, Alison, first Alison asked, um, how long do you think it would take to get one universal standard for sustainability reporting? And when do you think it will overtake the traditional financial reporting as the primary reporting tool. In addition to that, I would like you to opine on whether do you think integrated reporting would help enterprises be more sustainable? Not, not just profitable in the short term, but, but sustainable for the longer term. All right, Jeff. Uh, the way one reports uh, affects or has an impact on behavior. So an integrated report is very important because it starts making a company think on an integrated basis, which I think is absolutely critical. Very few organizations, to use a generic term today, still operate thinking of things in silos, as we were taught. Mm -hmm. And they all think on this integrated basic, putting resources and relationships together. So to answer the question how long is a speculative question. So I'll give you the challenges. The International Financial Reporting Standards Monitoring Board and Board of Trustees is the oversight body for the International Accounting Standards Board. Those standards of financial reporting are mandated in 144 countries around the world and regulated. Um, many of those countries, 20 odd of them are EU countries, including the Netherlands. And the EU has just issued its corporate sustainability reporting directives. They've said, and I'm not giving you the obsessive or verba, the exact words they use, but they said they will be working with the IFRS task team to try and align the corporate sustainability reporting directors from the EC task team, the European Commission task team, with the work being done by the IFRS task team with the VRF, the Value Reporting Foundation, excuse all the acronyms, in creating the ISSB standards. So already just in that cluster of 144 countries, you've got a challenge, there may be fragmentation. Now let's add the biggest economy in the world, the US. The SEC has now said, yes, we must look at sustainability issues. And the one I think great positive coming out of the merger of SASB and the IIRC is that the SASB standards are used by US companies in doing sustainability reporting. And the SASB executive is speaking to the SEC, people in the SEC, 
about sustainability reporting to try and get it harmonized. And another positive factor in trying to answer the speculative question is that the SEC is one of the members of the international members forming the monitoring board, the IFRS monitoring board. So you can see those threads may or may not come together. And then none of us sitting on this webinar, being on this webinar, should forget the two very important countries, Russia and China. And we can't just forget about them. <laughs> so to ask you when the world would have sustainability standards, I said to you, that is the end game. We, if you look at it, I'll try and give it to you. I, I tried to draw an analogy the other day saying there's a stream of framework providers and standard setters in the world. And we are on this side of the bank of the stream where we're starting to get harmonization now going in hopefully the 144 countries, the same as the IASB, you will have a sibling, a sister organization called the ISSB under the oversight of the same body, the IFRS Board of Trustees. And that will be a big chump, chunk of the corporate world. And now I'm going to try and get those threads together and assume that the SEC comes on board. And remember, the SEC is um, a creature of statute, that the FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Board of America, is a creature of statute. And US, is US GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles in the US, is controlled by the FASB. And we mustn't forget that the IRS, the International Revenue Service of the US, collects revenue based on the definition of revenue recognition as defined in US GAAP and not as defined under the IFRS standards. So all these are challenges in trying to answer that question. And my answer to you is it's going to take some years in my belief. But we have to make a start because we can't have what was happening that you had these framework providers and standard setters um, in competition because they were dealing with public interest issues. And they say, had the same public good outcome to make corporate reporting more informed, so to make accountability more transparent. And um, so the answer to your question, I don't know the answer to your question. I'm trying to set to show you the scenario and you can start thinking yourself. Um, I'm gratified that there is this like, thread of alignment starting to happen. And I think the SDG 17, we've seen the power of collaboration with vaccines for the pandemic. And I just hope it happens in regard to corporate reporting, because if you just start with, if we could, for example, get um, one standard of financial reporting in the world, that would be another huge leap. Well, we and the, that thought leadership at the, on governance around the world have been trying to do that for 20 years, and we haven't succeeded. So I can deal with some other th questions which have arisen, or do you want me to wait? Let, let, let me just ask you, I'm, I'm going back to what Richard said, Richard Rambaran. He said this whole question of uh, countries, small, smaller countries, a lot of them in the Caribbean, who have or may be very badly affected by the impact of, of climate change. And one of the things you said was, the bottom line of a lot of these companies were being subsidized by society and the environment at the expense of, well, in this case, countries like, like these, if, if we look at a country, a country level. The, the question that came to mind when Richard spoke was, is there an opportunity here for compensation and, and, and uh, 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 an accrual, if you will, from companies like this who have benefited, who have mm -hmm. been the, the benefit of subsidization, giving, accruing to, to, to repay uh, people who have been affected. Just a, a thought. 
it, the company the company would not be liable because as I've tried to point out to you, the company is an incapacitated person. Yeah, the true, question yeah. is the liability of its corporate leaders. Mm -hmm. If they weren't acting with conscience, then mm -hmm. uh, and then the question arises, who is the correct plaintiff to sue those directors? And the correct plaintiff is the company, but the law is not an ass. Mm -hmm. So the, the company thinks through its board. So the board sits and says, no, we weren't negligent or we didn't have this impact on Jamaica or whatever the cause of action is. Mm -hmm. Well, the law says, well, as a stakeholder, you can get leave of court to sue as if you are the company suing, suing the directors. But remember that if you recover from those directors, the money goes to the company. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go to the plaintiff who's suing because they're suing as if they are the company. And then the company has to pay all its creditors and at the back of the queue are the, are the shareholders. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Uh, Good point. So, so Susan Goldson has a question. She, it's in the chat. Uh, with the growing importance of subsidiary governance, especially in the area of ESG, and finding parent companies liable for the actions of their subsidiaries. How do we reconcile this with the sacrosanct company law principle of separate legal entities? And as in the recent Shell case, relying on soft law to achieve parent company liability. Well, if you look at, uh, go on to the IOD South African website, you will see uh, the King Committee has prepared um, a framework for um, uh, a holding company with subsidiary companies in different jurisdictions with different laws applying, regulations applying. And uh, there's nothing stopping the whole co who wants a certain, uh, let's say, culture to be throughout the whole group or the branding is important, the marketing is important, to write as the major shareholder, or maybe the only shareholder of that company, to write into the Articles of Association or Memorandum of Incorporation, as it's called in some countries, mm -hmm. uh, an agreement as to how they will handle the marketing or the branding of the, of the product. But the directors of each subsidiary company even if they're appointed by the whole code, their duty is to that subsidiary company, not mm -hmm. to the holding company. They've got to act in the best interest of that subsidiary company. So there's certain things that you can agree, which is in the constitution of the, of the subsidiary company, which binds, gets this holding company like the brand of Coca-Cola together. So you've got many subsidiaries of Coca-Cola around the world. But the branding is something which is important and it's written into the constitution of the subsidiary companies. That's the only way to do it. So it is a good question that you have today many holding companies where you have these subsidiaries and they have different laws applicable and different regulations. So you've got to be very careful. And the directors owe their duty to that subsidiary company, not to the holding company. So if you want to write it in, you've got to do it effectively by contract, put it into the, into the constitution of the subsidiary company. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Let me deal with my colleague from the Netherlands. I, uh, one, of, one of my favorite countries, my maternal grandmother was born in Amsterdam. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, I uh, I know the Netherlands well. I spent many years there as chairman of the GRI, and uh, not permanently, but I was in Amsterdam many times in the, in the Netherlands. And um, so I've got a familial affection for the Netherlands and a corporate affection for the Netherlands. And um, um, your question about your brother's keeper is one an intriguing one. And it's one that has crossed my mind and me concerned. And in my presentation, and uh, I'm very happy if uh, 
The uh, Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute makes my slides available in PDF form so that it's not distributable, but for personal use by people on the, in the webinar. I suggested that there should be agenda items, inputs to outcomes, because you have your inputs into a company and they have your activities, risk management, and internal audit, company secretary, and all these things, the activities that in automotive terms is the oil that makes the engine run smoothly to produce the product. But the product, as I said, is still in the company. And then the product goes out. And obviously there's a margin of profit because the company has to pay its creditors, has to pay its interest for its borrowings, et cetera, et cetera, and pay its employees. But then the product has an impact on society and those impacts have outcomes. And the outcomes of the tech companies is that people are in post and those tech companies cannot control what people post. <laughs> and the difficulty with social media is people are posting what is known as fake news today, which is causing misrepresentation and causing hostility. And the only way uh, I think where it gets to a situation where regulators have to step in and regulators consist of uh, a faculty created by the government of the day appointed by society. So it's a representative society that regulator. The same as a, a regulator would regulate the use of potable water, which is a critical a natural asset on planet Earth. So they should regulate the question of how social media is used. If it's used to create uh, fake news and hate speech, well, then human rights starts coming into it. But that's why I suggest there should be an agenda item at each board meeting inputs to outcomes to discuss the very question that you've posed. What are the outcomes of your product once it goes out into society? Because if the outcomes become very negative, you could actually start losing value. So I think that's something for consideration. The other thing is, you will might remember that I said there should be an agenda item at each board meeting supply chain. Because what happens in a supply chain, and the court in the Netherlands recognized this, is you should have a supply chain code of conduct. And that was learned by Walmart when one of its great providers of capital, the Norwegian Oil Fund, they had a rights issue, which the Norwegian Oil Fund had usually followed. They said, well, what's happening in your supply chain? You opening stores, you're becoming the biggest distributor of product in the world, but where are you getting your products from? What's happening mm -hmm. in that supply chain? Because if you, if the, your major supplier, one of your major suppliers using child labor, for example, mm -hmm. to bring down the expenditure in the production of their product, which they're supplying to you, well, then we don't want to finance you anymore. And, uh, well, they never had a supply chain kind of product for a while. Well, when asset owners and asset managers, so the capital markets have a huge influence in answering your question started saying, well, we're not following our rights in this new rights issue. Walmart started developing a supply chain code of conduct. And I invite you all to Google Walmart supply chain code of conduct and look at how they now in great detail are making sure that their supplier in that supply chain, exactly what the court recognized in the Netherlands, is critical to the reputation of the ultimate consumer company, Shell, in the example that you gave. So Shell has to have uh, a, take great care in its supply chain. And I suggested it's one of the agenda items which have never been on the agendas of boards should now be on the agendas of boards and not in isolation. The chairman, of course, should prioritize them. But we know what's like stakeholder relationships should be on the agenda, but not, it's not in a capsule that you deal with this. That is a thread which should run through your business judgment call, which that collective mind is making. So you should be aware of all these 
all these issues. So um, being a director is, is not uh, uh, honorific, it's, it's horrific. It's <laughs> because you are putting your personal reputation, your personal state on the line. And people don't realize that non-executive directors rely on information being fed to them by management. And therefore, you, your oversight has got to be skeptical. It's got to be skeptical oversight of what management is telling you. The same as assurance has to be filled with skepticism. So a long answer to try and answer your question. But um, there's no doubt that it's easier to deal with, uh, uh, I think, uh, the outcome of a product like Shell Oil and the chairman of Shell and I had a fireside chat in New York. It was recorded. I think it's online. You can Google it. And the question was, the question that we discussed was, in the pension funds of many of you online today, you will find Shell as part of your pension fund and a very big part and constant dividend flow into your pension fund. If Shell had to stop drilling oil tomorrow, you would have a big hole in your pension fund. So from a societal point of view, you need that transitioning to get to renewables. And now comes the purpose. What is the purpose of Shell for the long-term health of Shell? It must be, and the chairman of Shell and I agreed, it has to be, the purpose of it is to be a great energy provider, but in a sustainable manner. And But you cannot just switch off the lights, just turn off the lights at the moment. It would have a huge impact on the financial stability of the world. Mm -hmm. So you've got to transition these things over a period of time. And the court in the Netherlands have given them till, I think it's 45, is it? Till 2045 or something like that. Well, mm -hmm. they've got to get going. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah. But they accept they have to transition. But you have to accept that I promise you in pension funds of many of you online is shell equity. And if they had to just close their oil wells tomorrow, the company would be worth nothing and your pension fund would have a big hole in it. So all these things are integrated and interconnected. And Financial Stability Fund has recognized this, our OSCO has recognized this globally, that these things need time, same as we're going to need time to create what I call the end game, a globally accepted comprehensive corporate reporting system. So I'm trying to answer your question, but there's no easy answer to it. Great. No, there is not much. Um, and, and, and interestingly enough, this week in the New York Times, they reported where a hedge fund, engine number one, was able to put three of its directors on ExxonMobil's board that the management was opposed to. And, and their whole focus was on getting ExxonMobil to start thinking without being mandated about the transition from 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 fossil fuel to sustainable um, sustainable energy solutions. So again, this was a, a, a shareholder led um, initiative. So 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 very interesting. We have um, I think we have one, time for one more question, and we have one here about um, state enterprises uh, um, that have been incorporated uh, with delivering a government to deliver a government policy. Um, and uh, Joanne wants to know if you'll be prepared to opine on these entities and square pegs in round holes. Well, you, you can't have a bipolar corporate strategy. <laughs> you can't be, have a schizophrenic strategy. And when you have a state-owned entity which has a government policy to be mandated and built into a compact between the government as the shareholder, sole shareholder of the state-owned entity. And at the same time, you're trying to run a business which is going to show a bottom line value creation business. Well, you've got to, it's like being a schizophrenic because you, 
you've got two different things. You're trying to fulfill, and I'll give you an actual example. It was uh, Telcom in South Africa, which had control, monopolistic control through government of landline telephone communication. And it had a compact with the South African government that it had to continue building landlines into the rural areas of South Africa, which is, as you all know, is a vast country. Well, as they were building the landlines into the rural areas, thieves were stealing the copper cables <laughs> behind them. At the same time, they were trying to build their digital platform. So I remember speaking to the board of Telco, and I said, you all schizophrenics. You've got to renegotiate this compact with the government. You cannot, and it was eventually renegotiated with the government. You cannot have something which is not value creation, it's value destruct, destroying, it's value erosion. And you are also trying to create something which is of value to society. It's not possible because you're in the same entity. As you, you, know, you need, as I said, you need, you've got to be a schizophrenic and you can't have schizophrenic corporate strategies. They will not succeed. <laughs> this, this is why for me, the, the purpose is so important. What is your purpose? Who are you creating okay. value for? Um, so I think we are, we are at 513. Say I'm going to hand it back over to you to close off. Thank you, Nigel. Yes, I think we, 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 we've had such a very full discussion. And I don't think any of us really want to stop. It's really, it's really um, a lot of rabbit holes we could go down here with this discussion. So let me thank the members of the panel for that discussion and, and um, moderating by Nigel. Excellent as always, thank you very much. I think um, we have a lot to think about and discuss in the coming days in our sessions. And I would like to thank everybody for those contributions as we come to the close of today's event. And um, before, formally closing, I would just like to extend thanks to all those who have made today's event possible. Very special thank you to Professor Nudin King for taking the time to join with us and stay with us late into your night having these discussions. We, we greatly appreciate your, your being with us and, and those contributions. There are very many elements, as you would have seen from our discussion, that we need to take away and reflect on and, and discuss and hammer out into our own policies and, and directions as we come to terms with some of these things. I'd also like to especially thank Professor Bob Garrett. Um, I know you didn't have a speaking part, but you were very much present with us and we also appreciate your taking this time late into the evening to be with us and continue to be a friend of the Institute. So many thanks to our panelists, Professor Frank Punemon, Mr. Richard Ramran and Ms. Camille Facey for sharing your views and thoughts on these topics with us in, in this engaging and stimulating fashion, introducing us to how you do things in, in your particular countries, but at the same time with that Caribbean flavor that we can all benefit and share in. Many thanks to our gold sponsor, Republic Bank, for their invaluable support and assisting us in making this event a reality, and their representative, Kimberly, for her attendance and remarks. Our thanks also go out to our brand sponsors, PricewaterhouseCoopers and Angostura, who have also provided invaluable support to assist in our presentation of this event. Nigel, as our chairman of the um, Institute and of the panel, we thank you so much because you're always so willing to give your time and, and enthusiasm to the ventures of the Institute. Thank you very, very much. Kamla, I think we've run out of words to, to appreciate you for all the wonderful things you do for the Institute and your unstinting commitment to, to um, development of good corporate governance practices in, in our jurisdiction, in our Caribbean territory. Thank you very, very much. And, and we look forward to the rest of the program that you have um, in store for us in the coming days of this week. Finally, let me thank our administrator, 
Chrissy Johnson of Crouch and her able assistant Joanne for your invaluable support in helping us pull things together and facilitate a successful event. Finally, to all new members of our audience, thank you very much. You, you make this worthwhile. Your contributions keep the conversation going, keep the, the, the thought development process continuing, and we look forward to engaging with you during the coming days in the other sessions that we will be holding. I would like to bring formally our session to a close, our event to a close at this time. Thank you all so very much for being with us. I wish you an enjoyable evening and I look forward to seeing more of you in the coming days of next week as we explore the governance challenges and opportunities to reset and create value in our organizations post-COVID. Thank you very much and very good night to everyone. Thank you.